Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome to Turn the Page podcast. This is Jessica um, from Syosset Library. If you are listening to Turn the Page and you did not know, we are the official podcast of Syosset Library, which has been making me wonder, is there an unofficial podcast of Syosset Library? I do not know. But that doesn't matter because we're here with a really great author of uh, one of my favorite books of the year so far. And it's not horror, which is a shock. <laughs> Most of the books that I read are um, thriller, horror, sometimes fantasy, um, but, you know, pre-pandemic there was more fantasy and now it's just horror. But this is like one of the best books I've ever read and it's set on Long Island. Um, so introduce yourself and uh, let's talk about Jobs for Girls with Artistic Flair. Sure. I am so honored. Thank you. What a beautiful, glowing introduction. You're honored that you're honored that your book is one of my favorite books and it's not horror. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all, all of the above. <laughs> um, so I'm June Gervais. I'm the author of Jobs for Girls with Artistic Flair, which is my debut novel coming out from Pamela Dorman Books under uh, Viking Penguin. Um, and I did grow up here on Long Island. Um, I've lived in several towns around Long Island, uh, you know, Shirley, Mastic, Riverhead, uh, some, some North Shore towns now. So, um, and I actually was a library page in high school, and that was one of my favorite jobs ever. Where? What library? Um, at Longwood Public Library. Oh, Longwood. Very nice. Yep. And when everything was all tidied up, I used to go hide in the stacks and read. <laughs> Um, I'm not proud of, but also enjoyed. Um, yeah, so I, um, this is my first novel. Um, I graduated from the Bennington Writing Seminars. That's where I got my MFA. And I've actually been working on this novel since I was 19. Um, wow. I, I always knew I wanted to write a book. That's all I've ever wanted to be was a writer. Um, I started it when I was in college. I did not think that I would revise it quite so many times or, uh, that it would take quite so many years, but I'm I'm very, very happy. It was worth the wait to work with an imprint like Viking. It was really worth it. So this is the story of Gina, and it takes place in 1985 on Long Island, which I love. Um, I was six, five or six, 1985. I remember Hurricane Gloria, which is touched upon um, during the book. Uh, but is not a main plot point, but those Long Islanders who are aware that there was a hurricane named Gloria that was um, a bit uh, punchy during that time period. But actually the story is about uh, a young woman who is coming of age and she wants to be um, a tattoo artist. Yes. In 1985, when First of all, there, I mean, and I guess there's still a little bit of a taboo around people who are tattooed, but it's not anywhere near what it was in 1985. And while um, nowadays you can find women in the industry, although I don't know statistically if it's more still male dominated, uh, that was just not not really um, something you saw or heard of much. So uh, you've been writing this for a while. Um, where did all of these characters come from? And can you tell us a little bit about them? Sure. I mean, my love for, I think you and I must be around the same age because that's about how old I was when Hurricane Gloria happened also. Um, so, you know, the book is set in this 1980s tattoo shop. So I don't remember that firsthand. Like I was too young. Um, I actually, my first visit to a tattoo shop was around the, it was in the late eighties, but I was with my mom and she was getting tattooed. Um, so that was kind of uh, my one introduction at tattoo shops, but I was so close with my mom and I would sit next to her on, you know, on the couch, just kind of trace the lines of her tattoo with my finger. She had a butterfly on her wrist and I just loved the art form. I loved to draw. Um, I was fascinated by the idea that, um, you know, you could have art on your body. 
So then when I started writing my first novel, um, I said it partly in a tattoo shop because I was just fascinated with, with the whole art form. And you're right, there were not, uh, it was very rare to have women in the, in the field at that time, which is kind of um, part of the crux of the novel, actually, that this young woman um, decides this is the career path she wants and it's not easy. And uh, she gets into some trouble, but. Uh... <laughs> um, my first um, trip to a tattoo shop, this is like so embarrassing, <laughs> but maybe it shouldn't be. Uh, so um, everybody, if a tattoo shop will tattoo a 16 year old, it is not a tattoo shop that you want to go to. Oh, but no. uh, back in Florida in the late 90s, I somehow um, dragged my mother who hated tattoos um, to a tattoo shop to get me a uh, ladybug on my shoulder, oh my um, ha which has gone through many incarnations since it was not the best. Um, and, you know, like I said, don't go to a tattoo shop that would tattoo a 16 year old. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, like it was it, it was kind of it's been sort of like a growing, a growing thing. And, you know, you see like a lot of people and professionals with tattoos now. But for Gina, it was really she, she really wanted this, but like she had a lot of people telling her that she shouldn't want this. Right. And a lot of the book was Gina kind of trying to figure out what was best for Gina and what Gina really wanted. And, you know, like sometimes you have to just go for something or just unapologetically do something yeah. or because not everybody especially like the men um who were above her know better for you um and she also had a mom who was um a little crunchy as well uh so i, I really loved it um and uh, i learned so much like tattoo artists learn how to tattoo on grapefruits oh yeah grapefruits and pig's feet those are like two of the most common things um these days they also have fake skin they can practice on but um i think grapefruits are a standby <laughs> I had no idea. I really didn't. Uh, so her brother, Dominic, who she idolizes, promises he's going to teach her, but he's like distracted by other things. Um, and he's kind of not the best mentor for her. I, I like how uh, the other people in the shop um, in a way, fill different roles for her. I, I guess for Mackie, I have in my notes, ass hat, but <laughs> it's kind of an ass hat, right? <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't give her too much of like a warm bath of encouragement all, all around her. Um, you know, I had to put in some of the, um, the, the full spectrum of obstacles that she would have faced. And you're right, you, I mean, you hit the nail on the head for her brother. It's that at first he doesn't want her to pursue this at all. He's, this is not a viable career option for you. Um, you know, you're, you're not gonna make it in this field. Um, and she thinks at one point, you know, he thinks I can't do this anymore than I could become like a bouncer or a linebacker. Um, and then, yeah, for Mackie, it takes a different form. He sees her as competition. Um, there's some sabotage at some point without uh, giving too many spoilers. Um, so yeah, but she also, there's also a guy in the shop, Rick, who becomes a very warm mentor to her, not only in the sense of, you know, teaching her how, you know, the craft of tattooing, but also the, you know, when the going gets tough in a career or vocation that you're trying to pursue, at some point you ask, why am I doing this? You know, I could be choosing something more straightforward or path that more people take. So she has to kind of dig deep and, and think about her reasons for wanting to do this work. And he is really in that with her. So I think the book has some deeper like philosophical questions too about our vocation and meaning and purpose and work. Definitely. And I liked that Rick was almost like her surrogate tattoo brother. Mm -hmm. you know, Dominic was distracted with other things. Um, and I don't want to give the entire book away, but I just found myself so frustrated with him because Gina really, really wanted him to be her mentor. But mm -hmm. meanwhile, she had Rick who knew her heart mm -hmm. and knew what she was capable of and was willing but you know she was really holding out for Dominic um, another thing that was really just great about the story was 
her relationship with um, Anna, yeah. um, who is somebody who kind of comes into her life. Anna is lost in many ways as well, uh, but Anna can not really express what's going on in her life freely at first they're kind of brought together in this really weird way by somebody who claims that he's a psychic and it's just the craziest situation <laughs> that is yes all of that is true um i have a lot of affection for the character of anna um anna and gina both have holds different parts of me like there's not one character in this book that is strictly autobiographical like you're not going to read this book and be like oh that's what june's life was like <laughs> but they all hold parts of me um you know including dominic including rick probably including mackie i don't know um and anna i feel close to in her passion for activism um and kind of her like maybe spirit of adventure and wanderlust and um her whimsical side so i i do love the character of anna a lot uh, a few things that i learned while reading this book and um I, I just out of curiosity when you chose 1985 as the time period is that because um it was sort of a very early transitional time for the tattoo industry and for yeah. women in tattoos Yes, I sort of moved back and forth about where in time to place that novel, but that ultimately seemed like a really rich place to locate it because women were still rare in the field at that point, but it was like about to start, you know, opening up in the 90s is when um, tattoo shops really started to proliferate and like they used to be much harder to find and suddenly they're opening up in every town and the Oh, field 100%. Oh, yeah. 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 Like, and, and they're they're posh ones now too. Yeah. I actually was um, walking by um, a bookshop that we partner with called yeah. uh, Theodore's Books in Oyster Bay, and there was just this really uh, this really nice looking storefront, and I didn't even know what it was, and yeah. uh, it was like I forget exactly what term they used, but it was like a really exclusive looking tattoo place which brings yeah. me to my next point that I kind of want to go to so the word shop seems to be the word that's used um, mostly by the people in the industry um, however you know for those of us who were in like the 90s and when the shops really became mainstream the word studio was sort of pushed a little bit more, which, you know, I kind of go between the two because studio is really what I became used to. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to a tattoo studio, but um, shop seems to be really what the term is for the, the people there. At that time, I think it was. And that's something I learned in the course of writing the book. At first, I always called it the studio. Um, and then I started learning about how, you know, oh, one of those wonderful people that I interviewed for this book was a woman named Lynn Terhar. And she was the first woman to open a tattoo studio in Suffolk County. And um, she was, you know, like a lot of artists around the time, thinking of this much more as an art form. Um, so, you know, I think now studio is a lot more common and some people still call it their shop um there's some people who work completely privately and just say no i have a private studio they only take appointments they do not take walk-ins and so. i feel i feel like um the pandemic made that and also just like ultra custom stuff um oh, yeah. Yeah. really big yeah yep uh, was that now was that artful ink the studio that you were talking about the first um, yeah lynn founded artful ink and then um she apprenticed a young woman named kelly gelling and eventually um kelly bought the shop and she's the one who owns it now so it's pretty cool that it's now like two generations of women right right yeah um the other question i had was about the term flash uh which i think a lot of people who might not be familiar with uh, tattooing might not really know what that is. Uh, we think about flash fiction, it's mm -hmm. something really quick. So what is flash in the tattoo industry? Sure, flash are pre-drawn designs. So, um, you know, in uh, earlier times and still, I mean, there's still a lot of shops that have flash on the walls, 
Um, but yeah, there are the posters of the designs that you can go in and say, okay, I want number 23 or I want the dragon or whatever. Um, and you know, um, over time, I mean, custom work has always been done, but I think custom work is, bec has become more and more common. Um, so that's the story with Flash. So what was the first tattoo that you got? Mm, so like you, mine was a bug. Um, it was a spider. <laughs> were you, were you, were you 16? I was, it was my 18th birthday. Ah, and, good. Good job. Yeah, yes. 18th and birthday. Boy, was I waiting for that day. Um, my mom came with me also, but much more, you know, I got my love of tattoos from my mom. So she was, you know, um, she was supportive. So I got this little spider on my arm which I could never imagine a day when I would not want a spider on my arm. I just pictured I'd be 90 and still happy with this. <laughs> um, and eventually I realized what happens if you're a young lady with a spider on your arm is that um, dudes like to walk up to you and slap you on the arm and say, you got a spider on your arm. So after getting- um, Yeah, you can't, you can't hear my eyes rolling in the <laughs> of a voice recording, but uh, if I could make, an eye rolling sound it would be like oh come on yeah yeah after enough um unsolicited slapping <laughs> I was not that you know and I went through life changes and I got older so in my mid-20s I decided to have it covered up um and now I've got uh I had it covered up with an olive branch actually and I really love it the the guy who did it Eric Zabrowski is just an incredible artist you cannot even tell that there used to be a spider there um a good cover-up artist can just do wonders so another um thing I wanted to just sort of ask you about is just your research for this book um you mentioned that you spoke to the you know the uh, the person who started Artful Link and you also spoke to Kelly and I believe she has uh, somebody named Victoria working yeah. there. Yep, mm -hmm. Victoria Allman. Um, did you uh, did, did you get kind of like a good cross section as to uh, what was going on at that particular time period? Did you talk to a lot of people who were in the industry then? Um, I taught, yes. And I, um, so altogether I interviewed 10 tattoo artists and they really ranged through the generations. Um, and I, boy, did I look on some wonderful people. Um, I talked to Marvin Moskowitz, who was actually a third generation tattooer, whose, um, uncle and, uh, father tattooed on the Bowery in New York city, and then opened the first shop on Long Island. Um, I also was able to track down the the artist who tattooed my mom back in the 80s and it turned out I didn't remember this but she was a woman and it it turned out that she was one of the first women to tattoo on Long Island um she goes by Marguerite so it was just wonderful talking to people who had been there working at that time because so much has changed I mean the spectrum of colors that's available now was not available then. Um, the the, the, the hygiene... shading techniques are crazy. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. crazy. Yeah. 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 There's so there's such a broader range available of um, equipment, technology. You know, now they can sketch on iPads, and um, you know, obviously none of that was available back in the '80s. Um, so it was really wonderful to talk to those people and kind of get a little time capsule. Um, tattooing was not legal in New York City for a while. Yeah. Which I think a lot of people would be surprised because there are shops in the city and there were shops in the city, but they were probably places that you'd get kind of nervous walking into. And I'm not saying that they were necessarily not the best, but, you know, obviously if you're doing something and you're not supposed to be doing it, it's under the cover of, um, the law and you know you're not 100 percent sure what you're walking into when did it become legal and why was it not legal yeah so it was made illegal in 1961 um gosh i'll have to look up the exact year that it was legalized again um but i know it was still illegal in the 90s yeah definitely i think i think by the end of the 90s i believe it was either 
legal or that was about to turn around? Because I very distinctly remember being in um, parts of Greenwich Village and seeing shops that advertised that they tattooed and it seemed more uh, legit than the places you'd look down and you'd see the flash and you'd be like, oh, I guess they tattoo down there. <laughs> One of the people I got to interview was Michelle Miles, who owns a Daredevil Tattoo, and they actually have a tattoo museum built into their shop. But she started uh, tattooing in New York City before it was legal. And it was great talking to her because I was under this impression like, oh, it's illegal and they're coming and doing, you know, like the way you would do a drug bust and arrest. And she said, no, it really was not like that exciting or glamorous it was more of like that's good to know a health code violation I mean cops would get tattooed <laughs> so um for the sake of the novel I added a little I raised the stakes a little bit because my character Gina doesn't she doesn't know that she's um grew up very much like I did on Long Island not going to the city very often um kind of in her local bubble. So um, her idea though, of the risk that she might run by tattooing out there is um, it's, it's high. So I love the, I love that there's a tattoo museum. That's amazing. I really need to find out more about that. Uh, apprenticing, that's another thing you talk about. So Gina is, she's given this like contract by her brother which seems like a pretty strong contract, but I don't feel like her brother really had much to say in that contract. I think that the person who is really pulling the strings is the girlfriend who, uh, if you made it this far, that's what Dominic's really distracted by, but there's so, there's so much more to the story than just that. Um, when people apprentice, you, that, that seems like something that would make people nervous, like, oh, you're going to get tattooed by the apprentice. Uh, like, what are some of the steps that apprentices have to go through? Sure. I'm not an expert on on this for sure. Um, there's so many questions about the tattoo industry that I feel like I'm not qualified to report back on because I tried to dive really deep on whatever I needed for this story. But of course, like any field you get into it, you realize there's always more to know. Um, but I do know that, you know, apprentices have to learn you know the procedures for like keeping a clean and sterile environment and how do you you know tattoo safely and even things that I didn't know about um for example learning to tattoo at the right depth you know if you tattoo like too deep or too shallowly you're not gonna end up with a good tattoo um so they do a ton of drawing that I can tell you for sure um lots of drawing practice just like Gina did in the book um so but you know, I think also like anything else, there's good apprenticeships and there's bad ones. <laughs> and um, I- Where would you I, where would you say Gina's fell? <laughs> hmm, that's a good question. Uh, mixed, we'll say a mixed bag. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, the story was just like, the voice was beautiful. Thank you. Uh, absolutely beautiful. And the relationships that grew, especially between Gina and Anna, were so tender and so real. And I just want, like, wanted to be friends with them mm -hmm. um, and just kind of tell them it would all work out yeah. one way or another. Uh, but there were, there's also drawings in the book. Um, yeah. And they're lovely. And mm -hmm. they kind of help the story along. Uh, who did the drawings? I did the drawings. <laughs> you did the drawings. <laughs> but thank you very much. Yeah, the drawings came about while I was writing the book. I didn't intend at first to include them. I was using them. Um, sometimes I, I love to draw. I'm not, I'm not like a professionally trained artist. I've taken a couple of drawing classes. That's it. Um, but it's something I do to relax. And at that point I was doing it to help me clarify my thoughts. So if I would have a chapter and be like, where is this chapter going? What is the main idea of this chapter? 
I would find myself drawing and it kind of helped me get some clarity. But then as I was making the drawings, it occurred to me like these could be things from Gina's sketchbook. Like these could be the kind of things that she's doodling um, around the shop or as she's really, you know, trying to um, practice mastering, you know, like a range of drawing. So um, that's how they ended up in the book. And then uh, it was super fun once the book you know, sold to Pamela Dorman books. And I started working with my editor, Jeremy Orton. She had some requests for drawings. So that was lots of fun to, you know, like she really wanted to get a picture of a hot dog in there um, for reasons that the reader will find out. Um, so stuff like that. It was, it was fun drawing stuff on request for her. <laughs> this is again, a really good summer read. Um, and Blue Claw Long Island is not a real place, right? No, it is not. It okay, is I had to look. Sometimes there are places on Long Island, uh, which is, as I, I just said this in another podcast, it really is a very long island. Like, yeah. that's not just a thing people say. Oh, it, yeah. There's a lot of space here. Um, but sometimes there are places that I've never heard of before, and they just kind of pop up. Uh, but Blue Claw, I wasn't sure. <laughs> no, it's not a real town. Um, it was, I really d didn't want it to be a real town um, because I mean, I really respect Long Island history. I didn't want to set something somewhere and get details wrong and be offending people. <laughs> but it very, so it's- Yeah, Long Islanders will tell you if you get Long Island mm -hmm. wrong. They mm -hmm. are super, super protective of mm -hmm. Long Island. Yeah, so it's much more um, like an amalgamation of different towns where I've lived, kind of elements put together. And it took me a long time to decide what to call it. A friend actually suggested the name Blue Claw and I was um, I fell in love with that. So that's what we got. So once again, this was Jessica with Syosset's Turn the Page podcast. Our guest was? June Gervais. And I cannot wait to see more books from you. I hope you're writing more books. <laughs> I am. I am working on my second novel. I'm so, I'm so honored. This just means the world to me, like to work on something in, you know, solitude for so many years and then, you know, have a reader like you look at it and appreciate it and get the book and have it resonate. It just means the world to me. Oh, and by the way, because uh, it is still Pride Month, <laughs> it is still Pride Month when there's some um will go out. Uh, this yeah. book is um, a book that would be good for Pride Month. Uh, totally, totally. We only yeah. very vaguely touched on certain things about that, but um, if you've made it to the end of this episode, uh, there's just some really beautiful relationships in it. Um, one in particular. <laughs> so uh, we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.